Mm. Very polite. Mm. Very polite. Mm. It's more British. <laughs> okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good to have everybody with us in person and online. We are in our third series, third of a four parts, four parts, right? Four part series. We're third of our four part series uh, in looking at the broad strokes of the nature of the relationship between God and Israel. And so we started with the Brit itself, with the covenant, and we moved into the discussion around providence, how it is that Akadosh Baruch Hu interacts with us within the system of that Brit. And now we're going to look at the other direction, kind of. We're going to look at how it is that we engage with him specifically through prayer. And we'll have, a, again, a, a broad look at uh, some of the dynamics of prayer, some of the main dynamics of prayer, so that we have a better understanding what it is that it's meant to be and how it is that it fits within the system. And then I think that what we're going to do uh, for our final installment it's next week, uh, for our final installment next week, is look at the nature of judgment and how we believe a Kadosh Baruch Hu engages in that uh, with us, which is just in time for Rosh Hashanah. In our last session, we uh, ended looking at tefillah as a uh, as being parallel to prophecy on opposite ends of right? so the, the nature of prophecy is like Adosh Baruch Hu moving out of his realm, so to speak, into our space and our place to speak to us on our level in our language and in our experience and for tefillah and tefillah is us essentially moving uh out of our space trying to share space why are we doing that <laughs> don't you know? <laughs> Eurovision? Yeah. put it back what happened remove it as if they can't see Right. <laughs> Which is better than me, and I'm still there. Gallery. Yeah, thank you. Um, whereas tefillah is moving out of our space uh, in our consciousness and sharing space with Akadosh Baruch Hu, sharing space with God and speaking to Him about the nature of our world. Um, so what I want to do tonight is to be able to take that as a premise, and we're going to look at it, we're going to unpack it a little bit. And we're going to look at, first of all, the mitzvah of tefillah, the halacha of tefillah, and from that to be able to better understand the dynamic and nature of tefillah, and what it is that it's meant to be for us. And for that matter, God. One of my favorite places to start, however, is uh, where the hachamim kind of look at the first place of tefillah, and that goes all the way back to Ganeidah goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, in which we have this very strange, I mean, all of Bereshit, the parasha Bereshit, is highly odd. Right? It's extremely strange. And if you pay any attention to it, you realize that it's the strangest uh, narratives, probably the strangest narrative in the whole Torah, which um, one might think is apropos, but nonetheless, there it is. And one of the things that's strange about it, among the myriad of things that are strange about it, is that it tells the story of Bereshit twice in different ways. And the first time that it presents it, it says that God created the plant life, right? All of the flora. Um, and it all came out really nicely and almost followed directions, didn't exactly follow directions, but nonetheless, it came out, God saw it as being good, and they lived happily ever after. And then it starts the story again. And it says, These are the developments of the heavens and the earth. And it says as follows, which I will put on the shared screen. All of the uh, sprouts, the vegetation, 
of the field, which is a really interesting. I don't want to get sidetracked into being Doresh Bereshit over here, but it's re, I'm just going to call your attention to the fact that it is extremely strange to talk about the vegetation of the Sade, because Sade field is not natural, right? Field is a delineation of humans. There's no such thing as a natural field in the world. Right? We create fields. So it's already talking about it as though it is something that we know and have familiarity with in terms of our own creation and establishment. We delineate the parameters of what we call a field. And we use that word in, in a more abstracted term. You know, what field are you in? Yeah, what field do you specialize in? But it's looking at it in those terms and says that none of the vegetation of the field had yet come into the earth. And also all of the, you know, the grass and what that grows in the Sadeh. Had not sprouted and not grown. Because God wasn't making it rain. And the reason why God wasn't making it rain, Adam Ain, Adama. I'm reading that into the Pasu because it doesn't say that the reason why God wasn't making it rain was because there was no human. But it does say it in connection, which is strange, right? So it says that God's not allowing it to rain, and there was no human to work the earth, to work the land, which uh, shouldn't necessarily have. Uh, direct ramifications of stuff growing. I mean, stuff grows all the time without human beings working it. But what we recognize is this is directly uh, dealing with the interface between vegetation as it manifests for us in a meaningful way to us and God's involvement with that, right? Because it's talking about a field, it's talking about us working the field, it's talking about God giving us rain onto our fields, right? It's farmers, it's a big thing, you know, how it's going to rain. It has very major ramifications on the crops and their livelihood and how people eat and function and so on. These are very, very basic, primal, serious, human-centric issues that have to do with the natural world. But it is very strange that it presents it this way because in, at face value, it sounds like God's just not making it rain and there's nobody to work the field. So there's nothing growing in the field. Well, there's no fields either, right? If there aren't any human beings around to work. So basically what this is saying is that, that that whole dynamic that is quite familiar to us, unfortunately, it's not really familiar to us anymore because we forget that there actually are fields and farmers and that this, the tomatoes that we buy in the bin or in those little nice little cardboard boxes with plastic around them in the supermarket are not just, you know, they don't just spontaneously manifest there. There are actual farmers. And it's important for us to recognize and remember that, but it used to be very, very much in our, in our consciousness that this was the nature of our endeavor with the natural world and our personal lives. There was a ton of stuff, rain majorly, uh, a major central aspect of that that we didn't have control over. We were at the mercy of the skies and the, you know, that famous, uh, you know, precipitation system. So it's presenting it to us this way. And it's presenting it to us in terms of what matters to us. So it is not uh, shocking or surprising that the Hachamim read this as though the rain coming from God has to do with the work of man in these delineated fields. Which is how essentially the Hachamim see it, which we'll see in one second, which you can see it in the Rashi up there. And all Rashi is doing is quoting the Tashmara. Right? This is Rashi's own idea. So this, this, this interaction, right? This is the one area that we don't have control over. And the only way that we can influence is to talk to the one who is in control. And though that is the most primal presentation of prayer in Judaism. So it's always, uh, I always like to look back at that because if we're going to look at something, let's look at it in its, or in its origins. This is the most primal presentation of prayer. What that does tell us is, is that prayer, at least in our Jewish view, right, is meant to be something that is an interaction with God about how it is that God interacts with us. Because from the fact that it says, Lohim tir Adonai Elohim ala aretz, 
is absurd if we're simply looking at rain full stop, right? Obviously, it was raining on Earth. That's probably all it did for a, a long time. But that's not what this says. It's rain vis-a-vis -vis fields, which are specifically human and mean something only to us. And that interaction is what this is being is what's being presented in the Torah. And that's very, very different because this is not just talking about stam rain. This is talking about rain that matters. The entire Masechet Ta'anit is based on that. The whole of Masechet Ta'anit is based on that. Anybody who studied Masechet Ta'anit knows that it basically opens with this whole question of how God reigns on earth. The whole Masechet literally is, is, is built on that foundation. And literally everything that you learn in that Masechet has to do with that. So fasting has everything to do with God's involvement with us, which is most manifest to agricultural human beings in the form of rain. Now, all of us are agricultural human beings. You just don't realize it. If the agriculture stopped, we would stop. It just it makes our whole world go around. We just don't realize it. Okay? So that's a bit of a, an orientation. If we look at this, we see the Pasuk, and we look at Rashi on the Pasuk, and Rashi, again, is only quoting the Talmud. And he says, because God did not bring down the rain. So the question is, well, why was he not bringing down rain? Because from the Pasuk itself, it doesn't give a why. It just states it. God wasn't bringing down rain. And there was no human beings to work the earth. So no, it says the way to read the Pasuk, the gloss of the Hachamim on the Pasuk is, why is God not having it rain? Because there was no human being to work the earth, and therefore there was no consciousness on earth to be aware of the fact that there was no rain, to recognize the rain as being valuable, to then speak back to the rainmaker to tell him to make it rain. That whole thing was void. There was no conscious earth. Right? So he says, There was no consciousness to be aware of the value of rain for a human being that is of the earth, an agricultural entity that requires rain in order for his sustenance to manifest. And when a human came out, right? And knew, because that's what humans do, which goes back to our previous show, right? The whole thing for us is consciousness. Humans are conscious. And recognize him, that they are needed for the earth. And which, what do you mean they're needed for the earth? They're needed for the earth for us <laughs> to be able to be able to live on this earth. Yeah? Well, he spoke back and asked for them. And the rains came. And then the vegetation sprouted. So you see what's happening over here. What's happening over here is it's essentially saying that the fundamental nature of humanity on this planet is based on the sustenance around which it evolved, which is vegetation, right? It's coming from the earth. And that that requires the, the environment, and the weather, and the precipitation to function in beneficial ways, as they would be beneficial to us in our sustenance and living, recognizing that we have no control over that. The human mind rec looks at the elements that it has no control over, as though there must be something that controls it. We've got to speak out to that entity and ask for it to be able to be favorable to us. Well, we're not the only ones who do this, right? Everybody has their own way. I mean, you know, there's Indian rain dances and so on. I mean, there's all kinds of things that human beings did throughout history in order to try and have some effect on the rain because it was that important. And so this goes right back to the most primal aspect of our humanity. In Judaism, prayer, is looked at as a primal aspect of what it means to be human. Notice, this isn't Jewish. 
This is Adam Ay, right? We simply as Jews are recognizing that this is fundamental to the human condition. If we recognize the reality of God. And so that means that fundamental to the nature of the human condition is this relationship between human beings and God. It's one of the reasons why we look at Eretz Israel as being the way that it is when it comes to water. So it's hydraulics. As it says, one of the things about Eretz Israel is uh, that we drink water because of the rain. There are no other ways really for Israel to drink water. It's fascinating that their technologies have managed to find ways around this. But, you know, walking into that land was the only way. And that wasn't a fluke. It's at least not the way that we believe. It wasn't a fluke. It was meant to be, right? All right. So why am I saying all of this? Because if we're going to understand Tefillah, we need to understand this. That as far as God is concerned, there is a general de facto manner in which the world runs. And when I say the world, I mean our planet. That is random. It has nothing to do with what's actually going on on the planet outside of however it is that that affects the atmosphere and the weather systems. It's random. The only thing that has any effect on that is consciousness. So if you think about what human beings are, we are conscious earth. Right? If we recognize that we come from the earth, which is why we're called humans, or Adam, literally, and we understand that what we have become is conscious, speaking, thinking earth, the earth for all intents and purposes, has developed to a point where it can be aware of itself and aware of God. And talk back to God. So if you think about God, right, who basically, let's say he's got a black box that he throws a whole bunch of ingredients in and says, B. Which is all he really says. I mean, you know, as the Hachamim say, all of the Ma'amarot of Bereshit, the ten Ma'amarot of Bereshit, are just, you know, uh, elaborations on the one key word, which is Yehi, be. It's the first word that God speaks, and that's all he really needs to say. So it's be and wait, you know, and he waits 14 billion years, which is not a big deal. We could do that again. I mean, as the Hachamim say, God did this many, 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 many times. He ran simulations of various worlds and let them run until they collapsed. And funny, because what people don't realize is God destroys much more than he sustains in our lore. It is very rare for God to sustain a creation. In order for God to sustain a creation, he has to enter into covenant. Otherwise, it's doomed to failure. I mean, we, think about it. We can't even get through Parashat Bereshit without the entire thing crashing and burning by the last, by the last Aliyah. I mean, it's not for Noah. And the Hachamim say that that was the trend. It's very odd that the Hachamim say that, but they're pointing out for us that the trend for God is to create and destroy. And when it says destroy, it's not saying that God like just pushes a nuclear button and it explodes the entire thing because it's like excited about that stuff. No, he runs it to create itself. And if it doesn't find its way, it falls apart. And the only way that it will not fall apart is if God enters into covenant with it and commits himself to sustaining it despite every element of it aiming towards destruction. Yeah? So what happens is, is that suddenly in this particular iteration, he throws the ingredients in, says B, waits 14 billion years, and suddenly on one of the rocks, orbiting an arbitrary star 
in one of the myriad universes that happen to manifest around all of these hydrogen bombs, the, of which there are a trillion, millions right out there, there's one that happens to incubate what we call life. And it ends up producing complex enough systems of life to allow for consciousness to manifest that allows these entities to be aware of themselves and then aware of the maker. And all of a sudden, in this black box, communication emerges back, which is the most exciting thing for the maker. So tefillah is everything. Because that's really what it is. Prayer is that communication that reaches out from the black box of the universe to the maker. And the only way, as we saw last time, for that to occur is through the shared element of consciousness. And this is where it is presented in Torah. Everybody with me? So let's look at the mitzvah. So the Hakamim recognize that, oh, this is a key thing, right? So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to us in Torah, talk to me. Talk to me doesn't mean speak to the wall. Talk to me means tefidla, right? And there, is, there are halachic definitions of tefidla. Now, the Hakamim, right, the Sanhedrin establishes this, recognizes this as one of the 613 mitzvot. And the mitzvah is, as Haramban presents it, mitzvat aseli palel b'cholyo. There is a positive commandment in the Torah, one of the 613, for us as Yisrael, meaning the human beings that we are in our covenant and relationship with God, to check in with him once a day. That's important. As it says, and they base it on this pasuk, va'avadetem et Adonai Elohechem, and you shall serve the Lord, your God. Right, the oral interpretations of that uh, are that the service referenced in this particular pasuk is prayer. As it says, how do we know that service is prayer? Because we see in another pasuk that when it says, serve him with your whole heart, hearts are involved with service. <laughs> If hearts are involved with service, which service includes heart, that's prayer. That is the service of the heart, par excellence. Now, Harambam points out as far as the specific details of the mitzvah, being that they are deoraita, that they're from the Torah, in minyana tefilot minat Torah, ben mishneya tefilot azot minat Torah, the number of prayers that we have to pray and the repetition of the prayers in the day are not mandated by Torah. They are not legislated by Torah. Those are completely open as far as Torah is concerned because you notice that at the beginning it says, Pam b'chol yom, every day. person has to pray every day. How many times a day? How often during the day? That's not discussed. It's just check in once a day, once in a 24-hour period. Ve'en la tevila zman kavua. Ve'en la tevila zman Right? As far as Torah is concerned, because of that, Margaret, according to Rambam and the way that he understands the mitzvah and the Torah, and there's a discussion in the Talmud with regards to this, women are obligated in prayer midoraita because it's not a mitzvah. It's not a time bound mitzvah. A person can theoretically pray midoraita at any point in a 24 hour period. There's no such thing as not a good time to pray as far as time is concerned. There is such thing as not a good time to pray as far as your mind is concerned. Because remember, it all has to do with consciousness. And if your consciousness is off, your prayer is off. So there's some really important things that we need to then know about that. And that's what we're going to get into now. Right? So if I understand that my manner of connecting to God is through my consciousness, and I recognize that tefillah by definition means, as we said last year, last week, tefillah means meditating, right? The word palal, the root palal, is meditative, contemplative, yeah? And not inwardly, right? It's, it's thinking on something, focusing your mind on something is what palal is. So as we said, that Yaakov says to Yosef uh, at the very end of the, you know, his life, he says, I want you to know, 
I never focused my mind on what it would mean to see you again because I thought you were dead. It uses filalti. Filalti is the same word as tefillah, two lamids. Really, tefillah is tefillah. But we drop one lamid and put a dagesh in the remaining lamid to show that there's supposed to be two there, but we don't have them. Right? So it's tefillah, lamid with a dagesh hazad. That's the same word. And so the, uh, the whole act of prayer is contemplative, focusing mind, which is literally what kavana is. Kavana is to aim, right? It's, it's aim. So when you say to somebody, you know, you say to a sniper in the army, techaven, right? You're telling you aim, right? Still to this day, that's the word that they use, right? Techaven means to aim. So where are you, where is your mind aiming? Without any kind of talk to God that is not accompanied with the aim of one's mind to God is not prayer. As Harambam explicitly says, which we'll look at down here. As he says, What do we mean when we say that a person needs to have kavana without which? He says, Any tefillah, thank you, I have. Any tefillah that does not include kavana is not tefillah. By definition, it's no longer part of it. You speaking, but it's not you talking to God. And if a person attempted to pray without the aim of one's mind, the law is that he has to pray again with appropriate aim of mind because what was done previously was not the thing. And so it can't be seen as being fulfilled. Being that, all of it depends completely on one's capacity for conscious focus of mind. If one does not have it, one cannot engage in prayer. Now, when I say one cannot engage in prayer, it's more severe in the halakha. In the halakha, it's one is prohibited from praying. How dare you engage in talking to God when you know that you can't communicate with God and yet you're doing it anyway? It's insulting and, and, and horrible, horrible behavior. And so Harambam says very clearly, and this is straight out of the Talmud, this is not a Hidush of Harambam, right? He says, Matzada ato mishubeshit, if a person finds their capacity to focus messed up, scattered, and one's heart is preoccupied, which is what Tarud means, you are not allowed to pray until your capacity to focus your mind comes back and settles. Therefore, anybody who's come back from a journey and is either tired or concerned about something, maybe you lost your luggage or you don't know, you just need to reorient yourself to the right time, you were jet lagged or whatever the case may be. You are not allowed to pray. It's prohibited to pray. Until your mind gets settled back in the place that you are and focused. Amru HaChamim, HaChamim advised the general time period, which would be, which would make sense for this, is Shlosha Yamim. You should wait three days before you pray again, if you've traveled. Ad Until you relax, you calm down, you get acquainted again with your surrounding and pray. Right, it's something every Jew knows, which is important. And then he says, let me, let me help you understand what we mean by kavana. Ketzadiyah kavana. What does kavana look like in practice? Well, the first thing is, shifneh libo mikol ha-machshavot. Yipaneh libo. First is to clear his mind of all thoughts. Good luck. Right? <laughs> clear your mind, right? That obviously takes practice. And when you've done that, when you can get your mind clear and clean and settled, you then think as though you are standing before the presence of God. Therefore, a person has to sit a bit. You don't just rush into prayer, right? You've got to allow for there to be a settling of the waters of your mind into a nice, calm, pristine pool so that the waves settle. You shed melt. 
קודם התפילה כדי לכוון את ליבו, so that your heart is aimed. אחר כך you pray. And then you pray. You pray בנחת, calmly, בתחנונים, with supplication. You recognize that you're speaking to the rainmaker. And so you express very clearly your need for him to pay attention to the things that matter to you. So some people say, well, doesn't he know? Well, it's fine. Maybe he does. But his knowing never steps in for the communication and relationship that occurs through the interaction. And that's the whole point. It's the sharing. It's the partnership. It's the interaction that matters. And it is specifically the closeness of that partnership and interaction that allows for there to be real manifestation of God into your life and the world that matters to you. Otherwise, lo him tir, which doesn't rain in the fields the way that you want. It's quite random. And so prayer is really what makes the difference between a world manifesting for you in response to you, as opposed to a world simply running, and you incidental to its running. And all of that occurs through this interface between God and human. And the interface occurs through this prayer system, which is entirely based on conscious contact. And therefore, one should not make one's prayer as though it is a burden that he's carrying, that he's got to get rid of and can't wait to put down. Prayer is not a task, right? And this is that straight out of Mishnah, right? Anybody who makes his tefillah like it is a chore that is set, that he's got to tick the box off of completing, can never make his prayer genuinely supplicative, genuinely open to an interaction with God. Because any human being would pick up on that. You can bet that God picks up on that and relates to it accordingly. And so the Gemara says, A, that means that you, have, you should speak with Tahanuni. There's different opinions in the Gemara that bring what does that mean? How do you not make it keva? And Harambam is posek two out of three at this particular halakha. As is Shohan Aruch, which we'll see, but Shohan Aruch changes the words around as he tends to do, right? Nonetheless, Ayu Shohin Shahat, and therefore he says the Hasidim Arishon used to wait for an hour, right? Before they would pray. They would take like proper time to pause and settle and focus before and after. Warm up and cool down. Time. And therefore you can see also, this is straight out of the Talmud. And therefore, when we do actually get up to pray, it is extremely important to be sensitive to the context from which we are coming to stand before God. Because we'll bring that with us. And you better be careful what it is you bring with you when you stand before God. In the same way that you better be careful what it is that you bring with you in any room that you enter when you value the relationship. So if you're coming home to your husband or wife, or you're coming home to your children, or you're coming home to your loved one, or you're coming home to your best friend, or whatever the case may be, what do you bring with you into that space? You are responsible for that. And therefore, if you've just been laughing your head off in frivolity, you're not going to be able to get into prayer properly unless you really spend time letting that go and then getting into prayer. If you've been lightheaded, meaning that you haven't been really focused or paying attention to anything, your brain's been all over the place. That's not how you get up and pray to God. If you've just been having a conversation with somebody, you don't just turn around and start having a conversation with God because your half of your brain is still on the previous conversation. Let it go and then get up and talk. I've just had an argument. If you're angry. Rather, it should be within the realm of Torah. And even that, it can't be deep Torah. It has to be like very basic, easy Torah. Let me talk deen, the halakha. You got it from, you know, halakha, halakha points that are quite easy to know about. 
אף על פי שהם דברי תורה כדי שלא יהיה ליבו טרוד בהלכה, אלא מתוך דברי תורה של בעיון, you don't want Torah that requires life death. Right, so you see what Harambam is presenting over here. And this is again, it's straight out of the Talmud. The Hachamim are saying, you need to pay attention if you're going to talk to God. Simple. And if you cannot pay attention, it is prohibited to get up and act like you're talking to God when you are not. It's rude and insulting and terribly inappropriate behavior. So you can't just go and catch mincha. The question is, why do we do that? Which we'll get to, right? And by we, I mean the people who do that. I wanted to point out this Gemara where the Hachamim say it is so central and so important to the nature of our lives that the Hachamim say, Gedola tefila yoter maasim tovim. Tefillah is more powerful and more valuable to us than all of the good things that we do in our lives. In other words, you think the good things that I do in my life should speak for me. And it's not that they don't. They do. But without the communication, it pales in comparison to the actual attention and communication. How do we know that? They say for Moshe Rabbeinu. Who did you have that was more Maasim Tovim than Moshe Rabbeinu? I mean, he literally dedicated the last third of his life to, you know, bringing out God's people and making sure they didn't drop dead in the desert. Literally, they gave his whole life for this. En gadol ve ma'asim tovim yoter Moshe Rabbeinu. Af al pichen, and even so, lo ne'ana, ela betfila. The only thing that helped him out in this terrible decree that he had to endure and deal with, that he wasn't allowed to go into the Aretz, was prayer. Which is a very important point because the Hachamim see that Moshe's prayer was answered. It just wasn't answered exactly in the way he wanted it to be answered. Because in response to his Vait Hanan el Adonai Baritai, where he pleaded with God to allow him into the Aretz, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to him, Rav Lach, he was answered. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, Rav Lach, Al Tosef Daber Elay Od Badavar Hazeh, don't speak to me anymore about this. I've heard you. Ale Rosh HaPisgah. Go up to the mountaintop. I'm going to show you the land in a way that nobody's ever seen it. So he gave that to Moshe, which he wasn't necessarily going to give to Moshe. But that was responsive to the Tevilah. We see also that it means that, I mean, we have to look at what does it mean, right? When we talk, when we're saying my consciousness is what it is that connects me to God, that my focus when I speak to him, my ability to be able to clear my mind, to be able to recognize that I'm st- as though I'm standing in front of his presence, speak to him in that shared, focused space of mind, that meditative state of mind. Well, what, what is that supposed to be like? Like, what am I supposed to do in that space? What do I speak in that space? It's true that from a Torah perspective, it's extremely loose. The Achavim suggests that a good template for it is three parts. To praise, to speak of your needs, and to thank. And that's essentially how our tefillah is set up, right? Our Amidah is our tefillah. That's what we call tefillah. And that's how it's set up. But it's quite intuitive that that would be. Because if you recognize that the world is, you know, an expression of this entity, that we call God, and you experience it, and find the, the minor joys that you find in it, and the major joys that you find in it, and the experiences that are, that are enthralling to you, your first desire is to be able to turn to the one that made it and thank. There's this, there's this infuriating video by Dawkins where he's talking to, I think, uh, Denny. And, I mean, they are literally waxing uh, poetic about the, the grandeur of the universe and the staggering nature of the fact that we are conscious beings on this rock and then Dawkins says, it's too bad there's nobody to thank. And it's amazing because his desire as a human being is to thank. 
It's the most natural thing to do when you actually pay attention to what the heck is going on over here. And he has to say, it's just too bad there's no way you think, because he'd love to, right? But, which he wouldn't. But, you know, the, the reality is, is that that's the most natural response. It's the same kind of response that you have with the experience of any artist of any genre that moves you. You're moved by the creative output of this individual and you want to tell this individual. You, it's a very natural, that's what creates <clears throat> lunatic fans. That's how powerful the drive is in us. And at that point, if you actually do get audience and FaceTime with the creator, you and you have some rapport with the creator, you end up being able to develop a rapport with whatever, whoever the creator is. It is perfectly acceptable to say, you know, like I might want to say God of love, but you have no idea what your output has done for you. It's completely changed your life. It's given meaning and value and depth and beauty and, and emotional, you know, fervor, uh, uh, whatever, all of it. Yeah. I just want to imagine that, you know, there's a halakha, you know, in you know, that has been the subject of debate for eons since you died. Uh, I wonder if you could maybe just like clarify a bit uh, that it would mean so much to me. Yeah, I mean, people did this in Hanuman's lifetime. That's what he wrote response of, right? He said, what do you mean? <laughs> it would really be lot. And he was quite patient and he responded, and, you know, that's prayer. Except with God, it's, you know, this wonderful thing you made the world. It's really great. I love it. You're amazing. You know, it would really mean a tremendous amount to me if I could have a little bit more understanding because I'm having trouble. I'm very confused in my life. Or it would really help if I could have just a few more pounds in my account. It's perfectly normal and natural. Who else are you going to talk to? I mean, then people say, oh, I'm not worthy. Well, then you're an arrogant person. If that's what you think. Ironically. Right? It's a question of relationship. Are you interested in engaging in a relationship and being in a relationship? Are you going to say that I'm not worthy of relationship? Okay, well, good for you. Enjoy your life on your own. And you say thank you. So when we understand that that's prayer, it is very important. As a matter of fact, not only is it okay, it's expected that when you stand up in prayer to God, that you communicate to him what's missing what matters to you he wants to know that's the point right and it's not that he doesn't know it's that he wants you he wants to hear your perspective what does it sound like what does it feel like to be a human being in your circumstance from your corner tell me speak to me i care it matters to me And so when we come into that place, don't, you're not even supposed to get up and start the, the talk if you don't have something to bring. Because it means, well, then what, have you been like uh, asleep from the morning now that you're standing up in the hand, you've got something to say to me and it's just going to be this more of the same? Which is why the third thing that's presented, by the way, in the Talmud about don't make your prayer like it is a fixed thing that you have to tick the box to finish. The third thing is, change something up when you pray from the last prayer. Say what is new since this morning. So take a look. This is something that I think is valuable. The Mishnah Rab points this out. Don't tell any of the other Sfaradim that happened to listen to that. Every now and then, there's an important point that, that is pointed out. It's Haim puts a beautiful point out, in my opinion. And Haramba, so Maran, Shohan Aruch, he says, Yitpalel derech tahanunim, that's straight out of the Gemara, right? Just pray with supplication. Kirash and vakesh papetah, like a poor person at the door. That's his own inclusion. The Gemara doesn't say that. And that's something that develops from the tour. You should pray benaha, that word we saw in the Talmud. Veshulot tere'alav kamasa, which is an interesting way to, to present it, right? He says, it shouldn't look like. You shouldn't see it as, literally is what it means. You shouldn't see it as a weight on your shoulders, as a burden, yeah? So you're trying to get, get done with it, rid of it. So the, the Mishnah Haim comes on that and he says, 
perush, what does it mean, masa, that this is a burden on my shoulders? Even if the words you use are supplicative, right? If in your mind, if in your mind, you don't have any needs, you're just saying the words that say I need, but you don't recognize any needs, you shouldn't pray. It's a, it's a farce. Just you're standing before the king, right? These are the old analogies, right? If you're standing before the king and you're saying, I need, I need, you don't need, nor do you think you need, and you're just kind of going through the motions. That's also going through motions. You don't need anything, you just say you need. So what are you coming into my court? What are you what are you wasting my time? Okay? Israel, let me know how you let's say they hold that No, you do it because you gotta do it. You gotta catch mincha. No, I'm gonna do it three times a day. It's not appropriate to do that. You have to be extremely careful about that. If you don't have a need, you shouldn't pray. You need to be very, or you better think very carefully about your life and realize that there must be something that you're missing. Otherwise, who, I mean, don't, no, don't do anybody any favors. Look, he says, look, don't you have to go say the tefillah again, which again is going back on something we haven't looked at yet, as to whether you have to pray again or not pray again when you have things in mind about things in mind. Then he continues this in the Biur Al-Khan. He says further, he says, He goes, you, how serious you have to treat this, how important it is to be careful with this. He says, there are some posts, some people say, if you stand up to pray, and speak about needs without thinking you need anything in your mind, that in and of itself is a serious problem. You have to be very careful not to do that. And there are those who say that if you didn't do that appropriately, you have to go back and pray. Even that requires to go back and pray because you, you didn't pray properly. Why? Because you treated the tefillah as a burden rather than something that you genuinely wanted to do that you felt that was important for you to do. And then the question is, if you treat the tefillah as a burden, do you need to go back and pray? That's a halakhic question. So he says, look, the, the Bach, the Bayit Hadash, and the Araba say that uh, from the Bet Yosef, the Ma'amar of the Chiv, again, uh, that say from Bet Yosef that, they, that you have to do that. The Ma'amar of the Ma'amar the Chiv, the Magen Geburim, showed that from Harambam himself. It seems like you have to do that. I'll show you where their diuk is. I'll, I'll show it to you right now. Just to... to so that you have a sense of what it is that why they said that, right? Remember again, Harambam says any tefillah without kavanah is not tefillah, correct? Right? And if you don't have kavanah, you have to go pray again. And then he says, what is the kavanah? And he explains kavanah as being you wipe all the thoughts out of your heart, you stand before the shechinah, and what? You palil binahat tahanunim veloya setivetokim eshayano senasui. That you have to pray this way. And he and they they look at it as that's all bichlal kavana, and if that's missing, kavana is missing, and if kavana is missing, you have to go back and pray again. It's there's one could could argue with this and say no, the the tahanunim don't necessarily need to be in the manner of itself. Whatever it is, you could see that there's room for them at least to read this thing, or they, they, they're looking at it. So I'm going to pause here for a second. And I recognize that we're coming to close, but I want you to, to, with everything that's been put out so far, right, that we've said so far, is this the prayer that you know in Judaism? Right, so the question is, what in the heck happened? Because it's likely that with all of the myriad changes that have occurred over the generations in Judaism, this likely is the most drastic and the farthest from what it was meant to be. It is, it is, Close to being able to say that it's an aberration. Yeah. Yes. Um, what you say, take it to make till you make it. Does it apply to Islam? You should. Yeah. That's a very good question. Take it till you make it. Right. Remember that you're playing around with God here, so you want to be careful. But there is such a concept. And the problem is that really, really, the question is. Can one go through the motions of prayer without praying? 
Harambam seems to say, as the Talmud does, that it's not only not a good idea, it's prohibited. Right? Why? Because you're touching on talking to God. So fake it to make it is fine when you're playing in your own little room somewhere, right? But when you're now using words that are used to speak to God, these are sacrosanct, right? These, this is the dialogue that we use to speak to God. This is the mannerisms that we use to approach God. And I'm doing it as though I'm, I'm speaking to a wall, right? That's a, that's a serious problem. And as far as the basic halakha is concerned, it's prohibited. So what happened? This happened. This is the tour. Rabbi Yaakov al-Turim. Rabbi Yaakov al-Turim is the son of the Rosh. He spent much of his life in Spain. Friend of the Rashba. And the tour writes as follows. And he's quoting his father's teacher. His father's teacher was the Rabbi Meir Rottenberg. Rabbi Meir Rottenberg was the Rebbe of the Rosh. The Rosh escaped because the, 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 the Maram Rottenberg was taken captive by the Boim, and the Rosh wanted to gather money to pay his ransom. And Rottenberg said, don't gather the money. I'm going to stay in captivity because if you do this for me, they're just going to keep going. So the Rosh needs to leave because they want to get him too now because they figured he'd get the money. Now they don't get the money, they want to get him. So he's got to leave. So he moves to Spain because the Rashba says, come to Spain, it's right here. You know, we've, got, we've got full authority under, under, under the government. We can kill people if we want. So that is great. It's, it's wonderful. Come, come spend uh, time with us. So, Katab Maharam Radberg. So this really, all the tour is doing over here in this area at the beginning, he's, he's Talking about Kavana, right? That you have to have Kavana, that you pray without Kavana, you have to pray again, la, 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 going through the whole thing, right? Karov the Ma'alat and Nebu'ah, right? All of this, yeah? And then he says, the Katab Aram Aradberg, En Anu Nizharin Ata Bechol Today, we don't pay any care to anyone. Bechol right? In all of it, we've thrown it all out. She'en Anu Mechamnin Kol Kach because we really don't have such. I mean, this is, it's standard. Because what the Maha, literally, literally, our entire approach to prayer today, and when I say our, I'm talking about the general Jewish world, the general Orthodox Jewish world, the entire approach to prayer can be traced back to this, to the Maharab. Established by the two. And then established by the Shohan Aruch. Because Maran, he says, Don't pray in a place that causes you not to be able to have Kavana. La, 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 la. And then he says, Ve'achshav en anu nizarin The exact same words. En anu nizarin He's copying the tour. We don't care. We don't pay attention. So Maran, by establishing the Shohan Aruch, completely and fundamentally changed prayer in Judaism. And what he did was he said, because we don't know how to have Kavana, don't bother. And really what he was saying was, what he was technically saying was, he's saying, I'm saying you are allowed to go through the prayer motions and say God's name, and all of the Berachot, and so on, and stand in front of, as though it's a president, and so on and so forth, without actually doing it. You're allowed. Now, one can question, where is their authority to do this? Because the Gemara is quite clear about this. And Harabam is simply restating the Talmud. It's very, very clear. These are not like these obscure subyot where, you know, there could be, no, it's very clear, it's straightforward in the Gemara. Hachamim make no qualms about this. And what Maran does by establishing the Rah Maharam Rottenberg's uh, sweeping, uh, pushing aside of tefillah that requires kavana, is to fundamentally change tefillah. And that's why you have shtiblach. And that's why you have these, you know, these factory minyanim, bless you. That's why you have people think like, I got to catch a minion. 
right? I have to make sure to daven and I pray. And I'm sorry I'm using those terms because it sounds like I'm being prejudiced against Ashkenazim because Faradim do the same thing today. It's not, but it's 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 in the vernacular that way. And it's not just no harm, no foul, as we would say in America, using baseball reference. It's not. It borders on prohibition. It is in, in, in the basic terms, in the, in the source texts. It is a prohibition. So it's not a small thing. And it's potentially insulting. And so people, you know, they say, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't have kavanan, my tefillah. Okay, don't pray. I mean, at the end of the day. But that was the problem. In other words, the reason why this manifests is because they were concerned that if that was left as it is on the books, nobody would ever pray. I mean, it, it, it's clear that there were hachamim that went days on end without prayer. You know, the, the prayer, Laminim and Malshinim. Shmuel Atatan. Right, it says Laminim and Malshinim, whatever the tefillah is, that was a tefillah that was added into the Amidah later by him. And it says that because it's a prayer that talks about uh, heresy, that anybody who starts that prayer and doesn't finish it or hesitates in it should be taken off of the teba because we worry about them. Because if they're not saying it nicely and clearly, then maybe they're one of them. And they say, they tell in the Talmud that a, a, a year later, after writing this thing, Shmuel Katan got up and he started and he hesitated. He forgot it. <laughs> you know, to do with him. He's the author of the of the Tevila. What do you do? So Acham Avdi has an interesting uh, look at it because he says, you know, it says a biuda. Uh, he would pray once every thirty days because most of the days he was spending time in his in his in his Talmud. He would review his Talmud every thirty days and then pray, but he wouldn't pray when he was in the midst of that process. Of so maybe he was doing that. I don't know, maybe he was doing it. It's possible that he just wasn't, because he says that says in the Talmud that it wasn't shagur b'fiv. It wasn't something he was used to saying. And so how could it be that he wasn't used to saying? Doesn't he pray three times a day every day? No, <laughs> no, he doesn't. So it's not shagur b'fiv. So this is something that is fundamentally different than the average idea out there. But this is some not some new wave idea. This is not some you know uh, you know talk to God kind of thing. This is as old as Ganaidim. The ones who are changing it are new, very very new actually. And so what I want to say to you is that nothing uproots the dean of Talmud, not even Maharam Rottenberg. All that Maharam Rottenberg has done is allow in the Jewish arena for people to engage in the uh, motions of prayer without praying. It does not at all, at all, nor did he intend to, it does not at all change the definition of prayer. You're still not praying. He didn't magically transform the meaning of prayer. He simply said, you can go through the motions of prayer. And that is a radical thing to say, right? But even with that, even if we were to accept what that is, as Maran did in the Shohan Aruch, I mean, you can't get out of it. Maran Shohan Aruch accepted it. And he was posek, that you can go through the motions of prayer without praying. But it is not, well, no matter what they say, including Maran, it is not prayer. Prayer is kavana. Nobody could dislodge that. There's no nothing that anyone could ever do. There's no legislation at all that, that could change the meaning of what prayer is. So that's important for us to understand. If you're going to follow the law of the Shohan Aruch, it's important that you know that what you're doing is you are allowing yourself to go through the motions of prayer, but do not ever mistake that for prayer. Prayer is Kavana. And everything that was presented for the first 50, 50 minutes of the Shiru, that never changes, nor will it ever change. 
And if you are interested in prayer, well, then by all means, work on it. And if it means that you pray once a week, well, then you pray once a week. The Torah wants you to pray once a day. But don't make the mistake of confusing motions of prayer for prayer. And that is it. Okay? Stop share. Good questions. Uh, I can sort of understand if it's like maybe mean I mean, they're usually very. We can take that up with Maram Ranberg. I, I I'm not going to answer for the. Um, because the Sfaradim have accepted the Shohan Aruch. And because the Shohan Aruch was sick, the Sfaradim is sick. Yes. I, I mentioned that the, the only reason that that was kind of opened up was because there was serious concern that if it was not opened up, the Jewish people would forget how to pray. So they opened up the allowance to go through the motions so that we wouldn't forget this, this thing that we call prayer. I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm telling you that that was the thinking. That was very much part of the thinking. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So don't, don't argue with me about it, but I'm just telling you that that's the nature of it. I think that there is a very strong case to be made to the contrary. Yeah, that's, I mean, at the end of the day, I think what we see is that it is undermined. It's undermined because, uh, well, it's, uh, yeah. no, 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 I'm sorry. I, I, I want to hear what you're going to say, and I don't mean to shut you down with the greatest of respect. I have to ask you another question. Okay? Any others? All right, I have to look and see what we got. Mm. How to reconcile the idea that the main factor of tefillah is kavanah in the sense explained in here, the idea that tefillot with minyan are always accepted. Uh, it's, you're making an assumption with that question, that tefillot and minyan are always accepted. That's, of course, assuming that min, it's a minyan of actual mitpalilim. Two, I understand that, wait. Two, I understand that once the nosah of tefillah is decreed, we have an obligation to recite this text, although the important thing is the kavana. how to reconcile this idea with selichot's focus on reciting 13 attributes of piety as if reciting those words had any effect on its own. Okay, there's a lot of there's a lot of assumption over here. Uh, First is that when we say tefillah, we are specifically talking about the amida. Nothing else is tefillah. Nothing else. Everything else is either warm up to tefillah, opening ceremonies to tefillah, closing ceremonies, cool down. Nothing other than amida is tefillah. Everything else is supportive, right? So when, when I'm talking about tefillah, everything we spoke about tonight is either standing before God and speaking to God for that aim and focus, or Amida, which requires the same standing for God and aim and focus, but that's the formal national text of prayer. So the formal national text of prayer is what you're talking about, this, this matbea, right? The coined terms that the Achamim established for us. You're not supposed to change those, right? Not supposed to change those because that's just part of the national acceptance of, of, of our national approach to prayer. That's not to say that you cannot add elements into it. It's not to say that you can't say your own things. When you wish to in it, this is just the national text. Silihot is not prayer. It's not. Without an Amidah, there's no prayer. Silihot is speaking, you know, your heart and asking God to listen and so on and so forth, which is wonderful. And if your mind and heart are in the right place for that, it could be prayer, but it's not set up as prayer, right? These are collective uh, uh, dialogues in which we are bringing ourselves into a place of forgiveness, knowing that we are reaching out to God in forgiveness, if you do it right, then yes, it can be prayer. I'm not saying that silly cannot be, right? But they're not set up in that, in that way. 
So how to reconcile with the Sihot focus? So the 13 attributes goes back to the, the idea that if we say these things, right, we are maskir these attributes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the form of prayer that it brings out, because he says to Moshe Rabbeinu, that, you know, you, these are my attributes, you say them, and they'll be helpful to you, right? You, you, you engage with them, you, you be aware of them, and they'll be helpful to you because it's a way that I interact with you. So if you're aware of the fact that this is the way that I interact with you, it will help to form that relationship and connection. Yeah? But no words by themselves have any effect on their own. No words by themselves have any effect on their own. Given that women are obligated in prayer, why are women not continue counting in minyan? What am I missing? What you're missing, Yosef, is the fact that for the majority of history, women did not come out in conclave and congress uh, to engage in prayer in general, right? So it was something that a woman could do and she did privately, but much of a woman's life was in the private sector. I know that's really, really hard for us to imagine in our modern time, but it is extremely important not to judge historical establishments from modern contexts. For the majority of human history, certainly the majority of Jewish history, the place of the woman in the family unit was in the private sector. And so minyanim are public and communal. And that was not something that was open uh, to women. And it didn't really cross their mind. How come Shohan Aruch allows Tevilat Nedava if nowadays we don't have Kavanah? Tevilat Nedava is from the Talmud, right? So that's, Maran didn't do away with the Halachot of Tevilat. I just mentioned that, right? Maran doesn't do away, he, he's posseg everything the Harabam is posseg. And Tevilat Nedava is based on the, the proper, uh, genuine, uh, authentic definition of Tevilat. All Maran is saying is that you go through the motions. But it doesn't, again, that's a wonderful proof that it doesn't unseat the genuine nature of Tefidah. Uh, okay. Yes. Um, Appropriately. If they can do so with Kavana, if they can, if they can do the, so, no, it's not. No. No. Because that's saying that time bound means it has to be done at a specific time. Right. Okay. See you next week. Good night, everyone.